my name is Kathy. And I'm Colette. Today on the show, we're talking about an epidemic. Now, you may be surprised to know that some countries, including Canada, are concerned about something sweeping across the nation. No, we're not talking about COVID today. We are talking about loneliness. We thought we'd share a few of the staggering statistics that we found. In 2021, Statistics Canada survey found more than 40% of Canadians feel lonely some of the time or all of the time. The worst for those who are single and live alone. The same study found that nearly one in every four young people aged 15 to 24 said they always or often felt lonely. That was a, at a rate higher than any age group. The Angus Reid report also pointed out that fewer than one in every five Canadians who say they know someone who is lonely make a point of visiting them. And lastly, women are more likely to feel lonely or report feeling lonely than men. Now the effects of this loneliness, 40% of Canadians, has an association with unhealthy behaviors, and here are a few of them. Poor sleep, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and a weakened immune system. It can also increase your depression and your anxiety levels. Loneliness and social isolation is, now this is staggering, it is said to have a greater health risk than obesity and the same health effect as if you had smoked 15 cigarettes in a day. Seniors who experience loneliness have poor cognitive function and a 50% higher risk of dementia. Now, what can be the solution to this problem of loneliness? Well, we get a little hint in the longest running human study on happiness. You may have heard of this famous study. It was conducted by the Harvard Study of Adult Development and it began in 1939. They started to collect data on more than 700 people and they tracked them for the last 80 years. Their goal was to uncover the um, predictor of health and well being in later life. They wanted to see if there was a correlation between something and happiness. At the end of the day, the only factor that they could correlate between happiness and the quality of life was human relationships. In other words, friendships. So today we're talking about friendship. Ladies, were you surprised? at the results of, first of all, maybe the statistics that I read, and secondly, about this longest running human study. Let's hear your thoughts. I was taken aback at these statistics about the severity to your physical well-being. That totally blew me away. And the fact that there's been a study going on since, did you say 1939 on happiness? So I'm thinking that sometimes I hold back from getting involved with people or when I hear that someone is lonely, I actually hold myself back and think, I don't have time or I, I can't possibly help that person who's lonely. But now that I realize how critical and how crucial it is when I find out that someone is struggling with loneliness, it's not just their emotional well-being or mine. It's also It also has incredible effects on us physically. So for my own well-being, I want to make sure that I cultivate and nurture and maintain healthy relationships. I mean, we are very conscious of what we eat and we are conscious of 
exercise programs and we are conscious of looking after ourselves physically, but somehow I've never thought of being a good friend as being good for me, right? And to um, to have a friend, to be a friend, I'm sure that you've heard that before. When you were talking just now, Bonnie, in my mind came um, a plaque that I was given, and it's from Ecclesiastes, and it says, a faithful friend is a sure shelter. She who finds one has found a real treasure. So just think about that physically, spiritually, emotionally, being a good friend, having a good friend, nurturing our relationships is vital for our overall health, right? Mm -hmm. The great points. And Kathy, I, I go along with you and what you said that you've never, sometimes, you know, you think, well, I don't want to be involved you know, to go and talk to somebody or check on, in on somebody, especially if you don't know them really well. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it's almost like an intrusion. I, am I intruding into their life? Am I putting my mm -hmm. nose where it doesn't belong? You know, am I one mm -hmm. of those nosy neighbors? And so mm -hmm. we do tend to maybe we pray for them or we drop some cookies off with them, but it might just end there and we don't really develop relationship with them. So that's a really good point that you make. Mm -hmm. Paulette? I, I, I truly believe that we're a spirit, soul, and body. And if one's lacking, it affects the other for sure, for sure. Um, I guess I was told years and years and years ago about famine in the land of lack of encouragement. So I did take that pretty strong in my spirit. I didn't realize how much it mattered. To me, relationship is the number one in my life. Like definitely relationships are very important for me. And I think that's because I didn't have it as a kid. So I know the damage it can do. And I know, yeah, it will affect you physically, emotionally. If you don't have relationship, it is devastating. So I, I guess I'm a little bit on the other end that I will maybe like Bonnie, you were saying, you know, wondering if that's why I always say it's an invitation, not a summons, you know, and I kid around about it. But what I don't want people to feel like they're not thought of or forgotten, because that's the worst thing to feel like you're alone. So I think I probably go a little bit more, maybe I become intrusive or whatever you call it. Um, but I think it's important. I think it's important to connect with people. And I think I'm not surprised, Bonnie, in the sense that it affects us physically. I've watched people in my life that when they don't have people around, that the depression sets in and things like that. So that part didn't surprise me in the sense of that. Happiness, I know relationships make me happy. And the deeper the relationship, and I'm rich very rich. I've said it for years and years and years. I'm very rich in friends. And men don't usually do friends. Men don't. They do acquaintances. And usually their wife or, you know, girlfriend become their best friend, but they don't do it. But they do realize the benefit because I've seen my husband, even my son say, wow, you know, they see the benefits of friendship in a life and in, in my life. So um, men are wired different. <laughs> so girls, it would affect girls more. I'm thinking it would affect women more than it would affect men more. So maybe that, maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what do you think uh, the qualities of a friendship are? Like we're not talking about acquaintances, although it's really interesting to note that even relationships such as acquaintances or stranger relationships um, can help loneliness. So by that, I mean, if you go out into the community and you talk and um, have a conversation with the person behind the counter or another person, you know, in line with you, or you get onto an elevator and you have a little conversation, 
or you know there's a little girl that walks by you in the mall and she drops her teddy bear and you pick it up and have a conversation with mom all those really do contribute to um a good to relationships or friendships and they count towards dispelling loneliness so if you think that you know oh i had a little conversation with somebody today pay attention it might have made somebody's day and i'm sure each of us could really talk about and recall a time when you know you just had a conversation with a passerby and how it made you feel so that's really interesting i thought that even those count well an example was just yesterday when we were in the emergency and everybody knows how long and well, sometimes the atmosphere is not the greatest there because everybody's tired. And I remember words of life spoken over me while I was waiting. And uh, one lady said, I can tell you're a good caregiver. And that just taught my batteries because I was so, we were all trained. And just hearing those words now, you know, she might not have thought anything of it. I did. And I told her that I said, thank you. That made my day so it could be the smallest one sentence and it could make the biggest difference in somebody or just give them that extra room to keep carrying on so i totally understand that bonnie of just saying those little mini conversations that was important to me and and i was able to speak life into her too because she had just come in with her husband just before us so we've been we were going through all the tracks in every area you know triage or whatever it was and i said may i just say too i honor the way that you've been treating your husband too. And I could see her, you know, um, not that our husbands didn't appreciate it. It's just sometimes we just need it to hear it from a stranger too. Mm -hmm. I love what you just said about words of life, Colette. I know you've probably all read, right? The different love languages, but I guess would words of life fall under affirmation? And I think of the best gift that I like to get is prime time. Because I think we all have a shortage of time in our busy lives. So if someone is willing to take the time, to spend the time, prime time, one-on-one, -on -one, good conversation, eyeball to eyeball. I'll say that to my kids sometimes. I'm, I'm happy to babysit for you. I delight to look after my grandchildren, but don't be on your phones. And I'll, I'll do this. I want you to have eyeball to eyeball contact. And I want you to listen with your hearts to each other, because to me, that's prime time and to, and to give out back, right? From your hearts. So I love when you said words of life, my children say that's what they're gonna put on my tombstone. Because when they were little, I would say, speak words of life to each other, right? But to speak those words of life, to spend that time, to invest in that relationship, in that quality prime time is so important. And you're right, Bonnie, someone just coming by and saying, hello, I'm, I'm from a small town. So we usually acknowledge each other um, and say hello, or if we're walking dogs or whatever, have a little chat. And it, it's like words of life in a mini, in a mini version, but nevertheless, it, it brings life to us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I want to just mention that Kathy um, brought up mm -hmm. the five languages of love. And mm -hmm. so if you um, haven't or don't know what those are, we did a previous episode on that. And so Colette will put the link either up here or here, and uh, <laughs> you can click on that and learn more about that. I wanted to talk about when I first moved to Val Caron, right? To Sudbury. Um, Carol Ann and I had a mutual friend 
in Thunder Bay. And she said, oh, both of you are moving there at the same time. You're absolutely going to love each other. You're going to be great friends. I just know it. And my initial reaction was, oh, boy, <laughs> there's pressure. Now I have to love this lady named Caroline, who I've never met, and her family, Grace said. We would be wonderful friends. And I was leaving Kenora, where I had really good friends and was very involved in my community. And I arrived in Val Caron, just outside Sudbury, with these expectations that I have to love this person that I've never met. And my husband started traveling extensively with his job. I had three children, one who was just a year old and missing her dad terribly. And I was very lonely at the beginning. I thought we had made a terrible mistake. My little girl was very ill as well. And my husband was traveling and I was, I felt like I had been completely uprooted and now planted in a new community and didn't know anyone except this Carol Ann that I was just going to love. So uh, it was a very, very difficult move for me. And it would have been so easy just to stay isolated on my own, maybe get to know my neighbors a little bit. But I needed friendship. And you girls just so lovingly embraced me. And yet I still, I still had this pride thing. I'm much more comfortable giving. I'm much more comfortable being in a position of giving than having to receive. And it was really hard because... Um, I then had a new baby, my fourth child, who was really demanding, and I had to, I had to have some help, and I developed pneumonia as well. And when you have pneumonia and you have an unhappy little girl who's missing her dad terribly and a husband who's traveling most of the time, and two older children who are wanting to fit in in a new community and are sad that they've lost their friends. I needed to be honest and I needed to be vulnerable and I needed to humble myself and accept the help that was so generously given. I felt like you girls really invested in my life and we were there and it was mutual, right? Girls, it wasn't just um, you pouring into me when I got healthy and the baby got settled and I kind of found my way. I was able to give back too. I think relationships need to be two way. And I loved being there after a while. And I did love Caroline. Grace was right. <laughs> and it was a good thing. But I remember when I had pneumonia, friends coming over and having to do pulmonary pounding on my back and me spitting up all kinds of stuff. And like, it got, we got down and we got dirty. And Ben was born early. I was not prepared for Ben. He was born six weeks early. And I had to accept help. I had to. Um, and you know what? It was really good. It was really, really good for me. It was very humbling. And when my husband went on strike, it was really hard to have to receive groceries and meals and financial help to pay the bills. I was very used to being the person that had more than enough and could give and give and give. And suddenly all of this stuff was happening. Anyways, we were there for about 10 years and loved it and then uprooted and moved back to Manitoba. And you know what? <laughs> I guess I had to learn those lessons again <laughs> because my husband lost his job shortly after that. 
my little girl got very, very sick with liver disease. And it was very difficult, very difficult for us. We thought, again, we've made a terrible mistake. And again, I had to receive. One of the best gifts I received was Colette coming like the Calvary or cavalry to say, we're here to visit and everything's fine and I'm cooking you some meals and your daughter will be okay and your husband will find another job and everything's going to be okay. And honestly, you girls, getting together with you again just recently, um, there is just something that 25 years later, with only visiting uh, for a short time, three times during those 25 years, we have such good relationships, such good friendships, because it was give and take. I mean, there were times when I was really down in the dumps, and you girls came along and lifted me up. And then there were times, well, Bonnie, do you remember you came to visit us in Manitoba and you brought me the Say La CD. You know that song? You lift me up so I can stand on mountains. Well, I listen to it every weekend when I'm traveling to help a friend in Kenora. And I'm reminded all these years later, that's what a real relationship is, right? When one is struggling, we come alongside and undergird and pray and give and breathe life into each other and practically pound each other on the back to clear our lungs and look after babies with diarrhea if need be and bring food when there's no money for food. Like it's give and take, it's give and take. And there are seasons I'm sure when it feels like all we're doing is taking, but there are also seasons when we can give. And I was so blessed to go back and see you all recently and not just your faces, not just your voice on the phone, but to actually have that physical contact and to be able to step back into your arms again with no conditions, like, well, you really haven't been in regular contact with us. It's just like we could take up where we left off and here we go again. I mean, it was wonderful. I think it touched my heart so deeply that there are or were no expectations. Like, you haven't been here for seven years. Where have you been? It was I'm so glad that you are here now and we can have this prime time together. And one of our friends in leaving said, you know what, really? We don't know how long we have on this earth. We really, we don't know what a day will bring. So what a privilege to reconnect in person physically holding on to each other. And I don't know if, if you know this, but I'm a hugger and I will even ask for 20 second hugs because a good hug in order to release healing endorphins needs to be at least 20 seconds. Did you know that? No, we should do a study on hugs and the importance of physical touch. We know it so well for babies and little people and seniors, but even us, not quite seniors, we need that physical touch and we need that embrace for at least 20 seconds in order to release endorphins. Mm -hmm. I used to be uncomfortable with long hugs, but now that I realize the value of a 20 second hug, I'm holding on for dear life. <laughs> 
<laughs> because I want to be healthy, right? Does that make sense? A 20 second hug. It seems like a long time, but for those healthy endorphins to be released and flow from one to another, it's 20 seconds. Well, I hope our audience right now, all over, they are hugging people now and holding them for 20 seconds. <laughs> we could even do it to ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, no matter what your situation, God can reach you with relationship. And I think it's important for us to say, God is the inventor of relationship. I mean, science may be catching up in these studies how important relationships are, but he is the author of relationship. He is a triune God, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he made us to be in relationship, not only with him, but within each other, with each other. So we come up with a list of 10 qualities that we found, um, we look for, or we hope we are exhibiting as a friend to someone else. So we're going to go down that list and you can maybe add some of your own. And if you have some of your own, would you please put them in the comments below? Because we'd love to see those from you as well. But here's what we've come up with, our top 10 list. Number one, a good friend needs to listen and hear each other's stories. Well, I mean, this is recovering your voice. We're all about stories, right? So that's, of course, number one. Number two, a friend, a friendship, sorry, needs maintenance. And by that, I mean, you have to work at it. And I have a little story about this. So I wanted to talk about this because my mom exhibited this greatly. She was a woman of many friendships, but she worked at it. And for a while, she lived up in um, on Manitoulin Island, and all her friends, her friends, and she had deep friendships, like for years, we're talking 70 years, many of her friendships were, or more. And she, when she moved to Manitoulin Island, she made a conscious effort and decision to make sure that she kept in touch with all those friends down in Southern Ontario. Because she said one day she knew she would probably be moving back there and she didn't want to lose them. So she would call people regularly. She would, back then it was write letters because there was no internet. And she did this very consciously and it required a lot of effort on her part. And she would invite people up to visit and she would go down there. And it was true. Years later, I think 10 years later, they moved back there and all her friendships were still intact. So it was a beautiful picture of maintaining friendships and working at it. When you mentioned letters, that triggered something to my mind. When the pandemic first started, um, I was on my way to visit my mother-in-law in a nursing home or personal care home in the city. It was March 17th, 2020, and it was St. Patrick's Day, and I had green shamrock cookies and special serviettes, and I was going to visit my mother-in-law in her personal care home with these Irish treats. My name's Kathleen, don't you know? So I was really excited to go and see her. It was a, a Tuesday visit like I had done for months and months and months already. And I would book the day off and go and visit my mother-in-law. And I got a phone call saying that the personal care home had closed because of the pandemic. And it would just be a couple of weeks until they could flatten the curve. And then we would be allowed to visit in person again. Well, the grandies, my grandchildren and I decided that we would send a letter every week to Nana in the personal care home. And we would send things to her that would stimulate her senses because she had trouble with her eyes and trouble with her ears a little bit, but she still had very good tactile. So, and could smell things. So we wrote letters and we would put things in there like mint or 
her um, maybe something chocolate, hot chocolate, but we would make a little care package and send it to her and just write a little note in there with just kind of general news. Well, do you know that we ended up sending 156 care packages, 156 because of pandemic complications, uh, we could not go in and visit only immediate family, two members from the immediate family, maybe three were allowed to visit. So we sent 156 care packages. And what I didn't know was when she got them, the person that brought the mail to her she would, because of her I'm not being able to see properly, even though I wrote in one inch letters, she couldn't read them very well. So that person that delivered the letter would read it. And then when her son came, he would read it. And then when her other son came, he would read it. And then sometimes with the worker who was tucking her into bed at night, she would ask if they would read it to her as well. So each of our letters was being read four or five times. And there was a letter every week. So I just wanted to say to you, your, your mom's idea about writing letters. I know we talk about writing letters to shut-ins, but a lady that I just bumped into on my last visit in Sudbury just wrote me a beautiful card and what a treat to get actual mail. And I found it very therapeutic to write to my Nana. She recently passed away at 101 and I still find myself wanting to sit down and write her a letter. Or when I see that my granddaughters have colored something beautiful, bright, bright, bright. I think, oh, Nana will be able to see that. I'm going to tuck that into this week's care package because some of them were really, really big and really bulky depending on what the grandchildren were busy doing. But the power in writing a letter to maintain a relationship is an excellent idea. I'm just reminded, Kathy, of when Gord was overseas and the other soldiers. Sometimes you can make friends writing a letter to somebody you don't know. And um, the care packages, Gord was always great for sharing the care package. But when a care package came to individuals, it was like they were noticed and they mattered and they did matter and they were noticed. But if that individual care package, they wouldn't have got the message. So be brave and do it with strangers too, because you'll mm. be making new friends. Mm. So number three is um, some friendships are for a season. And by that, I mean, sometimes um, people come into our lives for a short time. And they may disappear and we may not never see them again. And that can sometimes be hard, especially for people like me who loyalty is such a big thing. And I, I, you know, wonder, well, why aren't they in my life anymore? I miss them and so on. But they come in for maybe a time or a purpose or um, a lesson that we're to learn. I mean, there are lots of different way, reasons they may come into our life. And then um, I think. I had to learn to, instead of lamenting the fact that they weren't in my life, to celebrate the time that I did have mm -hmm. and how they made my life better. Good point, Bonnie. And I love that you said season. I tell myself some friends are for a season and a reason. Hmm. And the reason is like sometimes it's a short amount. So long as... Um, I'm okay with let it releasing people if it's amicable that, you know, we know the season is done. Like I don't let go of friends. I don't like, I, I love to continue friendship and I'll say we may hit pause on our remote of friendship, but we definitely hit play and just start it up again. So stop is not an option. 
but sometimes pause doesn't hit play. But so long as we're released with blessings, goodbyes, and I mean good buys, I'm totally okay with that. I am totally okay with releasing people and blessing them to go further. Quite frankly, <laughs> uh, I've said this to Bonnie too. I love when my friends have other friends in their life. And I celebrate that because there's some seasons that I don't have to, it to give. And I know sometimes um, my friend might be in a season that needs some giving. And I love that when my friend has other support, it takes the pressure off people. And there should be no jealousy. There should be a celebration that there are rich in friends too. And then they can draw on, not to be rude, but kayaking perhaps. Because with my bones being so sensitive, I'm not as capable of going for kayaking. Or quite frankly, I don't want to go to an opera, people. That's just not me, okay? So I love that Bonnie has friends that she can go to the opera with. So, I mean, celebrate. Don't be jealous, for goodness sake. Celebrate what you have and bless the things that you can't meet them at. But no, it is being met somewhere else through another friendship. So maybe that's part of it, too, is the seasons and the reasons. Maybe that was passed. Whatever lesson I had to learn might have been passed. Paulette, I love how you said pause, putting it on pause and then pressing play again. That's beautiful. You know, and I just had something happen to me that was sort of that way with a relationship. It had been paused for many years and I lamented for many years, but now play has been pressed. And re reacquainting and and uh so you don't know what's down the way those people may come back into your life so really good illustration number four um and i think colette's touched on this we can have different friends for different reasons so we might have friends that are at work we might have friends that we do an activity with we may have lifelong friends. I have a friend that's been in my life since birth. So we have a picture, you know, of the two of us when I was just a couple weeks old and she was a year old. So you might have those kinds of friendships and you might have friends that you just just started. So we can have friends for different reasons. And just like Colette said, we should celebrate that in people's lives, that they have those different they, they grow us, right? They make us more well-rounded as individuals. And uh, it's important to have different people speak in your lives. Don't believe the lie that your relationship with a person doesn't matter. Don't believe the lie that, oh, they've got lots of friends. They don't need me. Because that's a lie. Because I'm here to tell you that you bring something to that person that nobody else can bring. And you bring a value of friendship that cannot be replaced. So if you're believing that lie, send it to where it belongs. <laughs> because quite frankly, every relationship matters and every relationship helps each other grow. And if I'm missing any of my friends in my life, I'm lacking. I'm lacking in that area. So don't believe the lie that they have lots of friends, then they don't need you. Can we just settle that right now? Number five, this is a big one. Um, for friendships to grow and to mature, if that's what you're looking for in a relationship, you need to be vulnerable. And we've talked about vulnerability a lot on this show before, but it's important if you really want long lasting, deep relationships. Now you can have superficial ones, if that's what you're looking for. But if you want a deep relationship, it's going to require vulnerability. I don't like that word. <laughs> it's like a I scary word, word, isn't it? It can it be. Is. I am much more comfortable being in a position of giving and having it all together and, <laughs> right? But I realize too that that's kind of a, a pride thing and um 
Yeah, if I'm if I'm honest, I'm much more comfortable giving and not being needy. Okay, and and quite frankly, mm -hmm. that's very important to me in a friendship. The vulnerability of uh, of give and take both ways. Um, you know, um, I I guess I equate vulnerability with being real, maybe. Maybe that's it of being real. And I, you know what? I I kid around and say, you know, I don't want to sit here and talk about the weather. I have an app for that. You know, I want to know how is it affecting your arthritic knee? I want to know, I want to go deeper with people, not fluff. Oh, there's if I want fluff, I'll go on Facebook. Let's be honest, okay? But with my friends. I want to hear their hearts. I want to hear their struggles because quite frankly, I take it as an invitation that if they take their mask off, I can take mine. So mm -hmm. as much as they are real with me is an invitation for me to be real with them. I will never all over them if that's not what they want. If they want to talk about the weather, then we're going to stick with the weather. But I, I, I'm sorry. I just see friendship. The more we're transparent with each other, the deeper we can go. So I'm all about uh, vulnerability. But yes, I admit, Kathy, it's extremely hard to ask for things or to say I'm needing something. But quite frankly, it's a coin and there's two sides. And if you only use one side and give, 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 we start having a kind of a pride about just giving as opposed to I need now too. And as Bonnie had did these 10 checks, if you might have a problem, if you're not asking for help, if it's this, um, I've seen myself in that not asking or not wanting to be needing, or, you know, there's different reasons why we don't reach out, but we need to. And that's why when Danielle had broke his leg, I did say to the Lord, who do I need to reach out to to get over myself? Who do I need to contact to get over to myself because I have pride there? And God showed me, it's like you need to contact with your blood family. You contact with your church family, but you need to grow your family with your siblings. And it's been great. I've been having really good conversations while he's driving us back and forth to these doctor's appointments at the hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. So ask Holy Spirit, who do I need to be vulnerable with? Or who do I need to take my pride walls down with? Because that's how we're going to get healed. And only God knows our heart posture the most. Number six, going along with vulnerability or um, Colette saying getting real. You have to be honest. So honesty or um, honest to have those hard conversations, honest to be trustworthy, right? It kind of goes along with our number seven, which is confidentiality. Maybe we can put those all together. So you have to have the confidence that what is shared is not going to be repeated. So I know when um, Colette and I and another friend when we first started to get together for what we called chick time, we, the three chicks and we would go out or we would start getting deeper and deeper. You know, at first it was very superficial. And then as we got to know each other and as we developed our relationship, it got deeper. And we used to say things like, you know, what is shared at chick time, you know, is not shared anywhere else. It stays there, you know, like what's shared at camp stays at camp, those kinds of expressions. So um, we would learn to put that preface if there was something very personal or very intimate that we wanted to share, we would say, you know, this stays here. So having, you know, some rules developing even some rules amongst your relationships in that confidentiality confidentiality piece is really important. I remember when I, I was doing the Thursday ladies, we had two rules, two rules, and it just touched two of our points. You leave the mask at the door. So that's, you know, honesty, transparency, Leave the mask at the door. We don't need pretend in here. Mm 
And the second rule was confidentiality. And it was a very, very strict rule, I'll be honest with you, because we needed a safe place to share our heart. If you do not have confidentiality, you are not going to go deep. You are not going to go deep because you don't know where it's going to go. But if you know you're going to have confidentiality, you will go to the deep places and you will have healing together. But if there's no confidentiality, you won't. You won't. There's just not. And truth is so important to me to be like people can make mistakes we all make mistakes but don't lie to me don't lie to me tell me the tough truths give me 15 minutes to work through it people because i'm a rhino i need 15 minutes to work through it but then i'll thank you later i will thank you i will chew on it i will look at it and then i will say yeah holy spirit did show me yes this is true how are we going to grow for not honest I am so tired of trying to read people's minds. Please make it easier for me. And just to say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. As, you know, a Jim Crest says, I love that. I love say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. Can we just put that on a bumper sticker? Number eight, really important. No judgment. So accepting people where they're at knowing that each of us are going to be changing and going to be developing in our opinions, in our thoughts and our actions. So accepting each other where they're at and not putting those judgments on really important in the friendship. I remember Kathy, you were down um, the time before and there was a topic that came up <laughs> and uh it was something I was still working through with an ism in the church. And if anybody knows me, an ism is things that I would say was like a teaching that I had to relearn that I, I believe was not uh, taught correctly. And I remember we had this conversation with your uh, um, like a house party before. And then I remember saying, huh. Well, I've grown in my isms. Let's revisit this, Colette. And you and I, Kathy, had a <clears throat> six-hour conversation one night and going over some isms we've been taught in the church. And it was interesting to see how the Holy Spirit was touching on some isms in your life and in my life. And I have to admit, it was like, oh, but Kathy doesn't believe. And it was like, you grew she's grown have this conversation with her be real be transparent and have this conversation with her and we did Kathy we had an amazing conversation that night like I said six hours uh and it was lovely conversation and I believe because we had this conversation the next time you came it was so easy to continue in our growth and walking through it so don't judge people from things they believed before give them chance mm -hmm to speak again into what they believe now. We are all growing people. Don't judge each other. Give each other opportunities to speak where they're at at this time. Because like the old, and I don't know who wrote it, but maybe Bonnie does. It's a quote that says, you do your best until you know better. And then you do better. Hmm. So I was doing my best until I learned better. Now I'm hoping I'm doing better. Well, I, I remember when we learned that lesson, you know, both of us walked through that, realizing that, hey, you know, 10 years ago, I believe this and I know that it's it was a lie or it was an untruth or it was something I learned incorrectly and I've grown. So let's give people grace <clears> to <throat> assume that they have grown also. And that was such a light bulb moment for us to re kind of rethink or re um, imagine, you know, what someone else is and to not judge them, you know, because you're judging them from something from 10 years ago. Well, undoubtedly, you know, opinions or thoughts have changed since then. So that's a really, that was a really important lesson for us to learn. And there is something that, Something that we learned in uh, counseling too was don't assume aside. <laughs> and assume aside, as the, you know, when you say aside, like 
homicide or whatever, something dies. Okay. And if you're not careful, it's going to be a friendship. So don't assume a side. Open communicate. Wouldn't it have been lovely people who would have taught how to communicate and boundaries when we were kids? I wouldn't need counseling today. Um, number nine, be willing, be brave to let others speak into your lives. And in this case, um, you know, your friendship has developed. It's got to a mature stage. You're very close you understand each other you feel confident you have there's trust there there's vulnerability allow those friends then to as the bible says iron sharpens iron to teach you and to point out things in your life that maybe need changing and you know sometimes we don't see it we get blinders or our spouse or partner doesn't see it because they're too close but a friend might see it and so being able to, I mean, that's a huge sign of a mature friendship when you can say to the other person, have you considered, or do you think you're really on the right track with this? I mean, don't do it in a mean way, but lovingly pointing out things that maybe need to be addressed in our lives. What do you think, ladies? That's a big one, right? Yes, that is a big one. But I think it goes back to what Colette was saying earlier. Um, mean what you say, say what you mean, but don't say it mean. Um, someone recently said to me, I really like the way that you approach things. Instead of saying, don't do it this way, do it that way. You said, how about if we were to try doing it this way for a change? I wonder if that might work better. Then it's not so threatening, right? Because, well, you know, when you're having a conversation and walls start going up and then you're kind of scrambling to get them to come down again, we are to speak truth to each other in love. Right. And often I think our concerns are not because we're criticizing each other, but they come from because we care and because I see that you are struggling and I want to help. And I wonder if maybe um, we were to try this, you know, and then you're embracing that person. You're not not saying you've got a problem, right? Be because walls will come up, right? We, we are human and we can be offended very easily, especially if we're not always good communicators because I think sometimes we hear things differently than the person is actually trying to say to us. And if we have a relationship, like you pointed out, Bonnie, that we've known each other for a while and we've been through lots of stuff together, we're coming from a foundation of care that, that just happened uh, recently to me when someone was offended uh, with something that someone else had said. And I said, hold on a minute. You know that that person loves you that they have your best interest at heart. So if that had been coming from a stranger, yes, there could have been an opportunity for offense, but knowing that that person has your back and your best interest at heart, take that into consideration. They're speaking to you as a good friend who loves you. So if they are willing to even be misunderstood or possibly cause an offense, then maybe you really need to listen to what they're trying to tell you. In fact, I remember, I remember Carol Ann years ago, and if she was here with us, I'm sure she would, she would vouch for it. A situation had come up and at first 
she was hurt and she was offended. And then as she thought about it, she said something like, you know what, that person really loves me. They were going out on a limb to speak truth to me. I appreciate that. Iron sharpens iron. And it turned everything. As soon as she really thought about it, instead of taking offense and putting up walls, which we can do so quickly, right? Because we're so sensitive sometimes. And it's often in an area, I know if I'm struggling in that area, I'm going to really protest a lot. You, Colette, will say to me, and have said to me, every time we point a finger at someone, we need to realize, what do you say, that there are three pointing back at us? And I think you said one up to God, one pointed at the other person, but three are pointing back at you. So if you do take offense, chances are that might be an area where you're struggling. And because you love me, and I know that after all these years, I can receive that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It reminds me of Brene Brown when she says, if somebody gives me opinion, they better be in the arena with me. Hmm. Okay. And, and you've been in the arena with me, Kathy. And I love, and I've said this to Bonnie, I know sometimes I can go off on a tangent. I know it. Okay. It just, you're raised with four kids in the home and you're the youngest. You, if you get the mic, you use the mic. Okay. <laughs> and I love that we have a relationship that you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Listen, listen, Colette. And mm. I'm not offended. It's like, yes, Colette, regroup, re-listen. And it goes through my love filters, but that's because the relationship built the love filters. You can't expect this to happen like this when you first meet, like Bonnie said, chick time took years to evolve to become chick time. Friendship will take years to evolve or sometimes not years, depending how fast and how deep you go. But I always put it through my love filters and I know if this person loves me, it's like, pay attention here. They are mm. doing this for your good and it's costing them to say, it. nobody wants to say something that, your friend might need to be aware of. But I've had tough conversations with Bonnie. I've had tough conversations with you. And they usually start with, hmm, my monkeys in the brain are saying this. Have I offended you? Or we will talk it out. And it's crucial, people. Let's get real with each other and just instead of fluff. So yes, Kathy, if you're in the arena with me, I take note because you're in there too and you know what it's costing to be in the arena so yes I believe that Kathy with all my heart I do and when when we say it's the scripture don't look at your speck in your brother's eye when you have a log jam in your own right he's not saying don't help our friends he says first deal with your log jam so that you may be able to to help that's the three fingers so if mm. you're trying to help me through a log jam because mm. i'm not seeing clearly and all i'm going is uh yeah i don't like this so i'm out of here no that's not going to go to well that there's a couple of things that um between you and kathy that i i was reminded of and one was something that you always say colette you'll check and you'll say are we good here yeah. you know mm -hmm. is there something we need to address and that's really important. And it made me think of a really important one that we haven't got on our list. And that mm. is being willing to apologize. Mm. A humility, humility to step out and say, I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings, or I'm sorry that I said that. That was in anger, or that was because I was frustrated, or whatever. But just being able to admit any failures or any mistakes that you've made in that relationship. That is huge also. That is crucial. I call it owning my stuff. Mm -hmm. We all need to own our stuff. And quite frankly, society is not big on owning their stuff. So we as believers should be setting the pace of owning our stuff and apologizing when we're wrong. So I think those all lead to number 10, 
which mm -hmm. is friendships can sometimes be a sacrifice or require a sacrifice. So a sacrifice in humility, you know, reaching out saying I'm sorry or making restitution. It could be a sacrifice of finances. It's especially a sacrifice of time. You know, you need to spend time. You cannot have a friendship without time. So you need to be available. Sometimes you need to drop everything for a friend in need. And sometimes you have to have that hard conversation where you say, I can't be there for you right now, like Colette mentioned earlier. So it, there is sacrifice in friendship. So we started mentioning all these studies that are noticing that loneliness is a problem in our society. And there's been all kinds of solutions offered. But as that, you know, 80 year study proved, friendship is extremely important. So we feel the antidote to loneliness is friendship. So if you're one of those people that have not reached out to someone who you know is living alone, who might be, you know, behind a computer in the basement of an apartment and not getting out, maybe you can be the brave person and change that one out of five people to, you know, five out of five people that are going and knocking on the door and checking on those people. Let's be a people reaching out to our neighbors, our community, people at church. You know, it could be as simple as inviting someone over for lunch that maybe lives alone. Or it could be offering a ride to someone. It could be, you know, the neighbor down the street that you just haven't seen in a few days and checking on them. We need to be the solution to loneliness. We were made for relationship. So let's reach out. Let's be brave this week and reach out and, you know, say hello to someone in the store, have a conversation with someone at work um, on your break that maybe you don't know, or talk to that young mom at church who's struggling with, you know, a new baby at home. It can be in numerous ways, but it can mean so much to someone else. So loneliness has a cure. It's called friendship. Ladies, if you were someone out there watching this right now, and you're one of those people, you know, one of those statistics of someone who is feeling very lonely, what would you suggest them to do? If this is intimidating for you, relationships, which it can be, start easy with a stranger, pen pal. Sign up for a pen pal. You'll learn how to communicate. You'll learn how to talk and grow it. I get it. It doesn't happen overnight. I get relationships are built. And I get that if this is a new concept for you, a friendship, then yeah, start small. Like, and what I mean by small is start with that and, and work your way up. So a pen pal is a great way to start communicating with somebody if you have nobody to reach out to right now. And, and look for people who have similar interests to you. I have a friend who just moved to the area a couple of years ago. She's an older lady and she went to a social group where they were doing line dancing because she was interested in line dancing. But maybe you're a crocheter and you want to reach out to people who crochet or you do a certain sport or you're interested in going to, you know, the why. You can meet people who have common interests to you. And that's a really good starting point. The personal care homes, oh my goodness, they are begging for volunteers. And that would be a wonderful place to start by going in and reading to somebody, giving to the community somehow. We're in a volunteer crisis. Uh, people are so busy with their lives and often, um, Jobs are taking over so much of our lives. Um, and yet, I know from going into personal care homes that even if you just started by giving a few hours once a week, you can really make someone's life so much better. And by giving 
you receive so much. So why not volunteer somewhere? If it's hard for you to do a one-on-one, -on -one, why not you know, check out your community newspaper and volunteer? Yes, a soup kitchen, a food bank, you know, schools. There's all kinds of places that will, would love to have you come join mm -hmm. us. If you're having trouble reaching out or you're feeling alone and unable to get out, then you can reach out to us. We'd love to be friends with you and you can write us. It's confidential. Write us at recoveringyourvoice at gmail.com and we will answer your email. But until next time, please keep sharing your stories. Normally we go Bonnie, Carol, and Colette. So today do we do want to do Bonnie, Kathy, Colette? Sure. Yeah. Because Colette's used to going last. And so oh, oh. the last oh, that's the a good thing. Show me first. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good thing, honey. I got to get the Levi. Okay. Oh, Levi. He's chewing something. Levi, come. Oh, <laughs> she goes from her, her sweet self to Levi, come. <laughs> Did Levi come? I would have come if you talked to me like that. <laughs> Levi. That was oh. her authoritative voice. <laughs> I say, Amen. say it like you mean it. <laughs> Love it. Oh, okay. Anyways. Okay, I'll behave, Bonnie. Okay. <laughs> five minutes. You got five minutes, girl. Okay. <laughs> okay, and we will change views. Good. Now I can do this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're getting darker. darker, Kathy. Oh, I am? Yeah. Oh. I have the sun, but the sun's disappeared. Okay. They must have needed my light bulb downstairs. One sec. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like our house. Oh, you that's much oh there you go. Oh, Can you lend me a light bulb? <laughs> I'm thinking, what's wrong with this lamp? Oh, <laughs> something science experiment, probably. They needed the old fashioned light bulb versus the new LED. Yeah. Is that my dog at the door? Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> and here's something. <laughs> I'll get rid of her. One moment, please. <laughs> Let's, oh, we will now go to a commercial break. And Kathy, there was some unusual noise behind, while you were talking. Do you want to explain to the um, audience uh, what that strange sound was? Do you have a bird or something? Oh, yes. I have a ringneck dove. <laughs> His name is Sage. And when he hears me laughing or talking, even though I have him in the pet room, um, he will do that. He, he's just um, telling me that he hears me and he's, he's very affectionate. He loves to sit on my head. If I were to open the door, he would come <laughs> probably flying out and land on my head. No, okay. Forget it. I don't want to be vulnerable. Take that out of there, Bonnie. Cut, 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 cut. <laughs> okay. I'm off my, my soapbox now for five minutes. <laughs>